My name's George, and I edit The Imperfects. I grew up on Ngunnawal country, studied on Bundjalung country, and am now living and working on Wurundjeri country. On behalf of The Imperfects, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast was recorded, and we extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The rich storytelling history of the world's oldest living culture is what we proudly pay homage to when we share stories on The Imperfects. The Imperfects invites you into a very safe place. A place where we share without judgment and drink heaps and heaps of vulnerability. Grab yourself a cup. This is the Vulnerability House. Well, we are itching to get going. We've already, we've already started asking questions and talking um, to Bronte, and uh, but we're we're excited. We've got we've got a, an Olympic gold medalist, two time, many medalist per many medalist person. Twenty eight medals she's got. Twenty eight. Did you know that? Do you know you got twenty eight medals? Like as in medals that would would if you were to look up your. Do I have twenty eight? You're twenty eight. I thought I had twenty seven. Wow. That's excellent because I wanted it to be the same as my age. And I'm 28, and I've got 28 medals, oh. which means that I'm turning 29 this year, so I'm going to have to- What are you going to do? Win something. I'm going to have to win something. <laughs> oh, God. We could give you a medal. <laughs> Great. I'll when take it. Win 29. <laughs> yeah. um, well, yes, Bronte Campbell is here in the Vulnerability House. Uh, Hugh, I will leave it to you to, to read the long list of- Oh, actually, it's slightly different today, the way that we're going to in- introduce <laughs> our, <laughs> our guest- and I hope you don't mind, Bronte, but um, we – so Bridget, our producer, as who you know, she always always writes the, the bios for all of our guests. And recently we realised that because there's this new thing called chat GPT, you heard of this, like AI, you know? Yeah. So uh, we, we sort of realised that, well, I guess like AI could probably write these bios, especially for people who have like a public profile and, you know, have information – so what we've done today is the bio has been written by artificial intelligence and Hugh's going to read it and then you can let us know how right or wrong <laughs> Okay, got it. well, I'm not going to take the 28 medals as fact. <laughs> 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 Maybe I don't have 28, I don't know. Um, that's very funny. Yeah. I actually did this the other day for oh, myself you? because someone asked for a bio and I don't have one yeah. and... I asked the free GTP, yes. not like the paid one. Yeah, I asked it to do it, and it was it was very wrong. So <laughs> okay. I, can't, I can't wait to see what this says. Standing at twenty feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Brody Campbell is an Australian former swimmer, born on May 14, nineteen ninety four, in Malawi. So far, so well. Former. Well, swimmer? I'm not a former swimmer because no. I've never retired. And I'm still swimming, so wrong wrong. wrong already. (laughs) Uh, She's known for her freestyle sprinting ability and has been a part of the Australian national team since 2012. Campbell's career highlights include winning two gold medals at the 2016 Rio Olympics in the 4x100m freestyle and the 4x100m medley realise. That's not right. Okay. What's what's the correction on that? Um, I was only in the freestyle relay, which we won golden. That was my only medal at that Olympics. Okay, Uh, okay. Sorry if that was insensitive of AI. <laughs> to, to, yeah, yeah. But, Let's agree you don't have to apologise for the robot. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good call. And a silver medal in the individual 50 metre freestyle event. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These seems like very concrete things for it to get wrong. This robot's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout her career, Campbell has set several national and world records. In 2016, she became the first Australian woman to break the 52-second mark in a 100-metre freestyle. That didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Setting a new world record in a time of 51.67 seconds. Yeah, so the world record is 51.76 seconds and it's had by Sarah Kirsten from um, Sweden. So that is not even at all correct. She's <laughs> more like artificial intelligence, <laughs> am I right? <laughs> in 2021, Campbell announced, her ret- Campbell announced her retirement from competitive swimming. Wrong. Didn't happen. Citing the desire to pursue other interests outside of the sport. Yeah. I mean, I, sa- I did say I was having a break. Okay. And okay. I did say an indefinite break, and we all remember Silverchair did that. 
Oh, and they haven't got back together, yeah. so maybe... <laughs> we all remember that. We all do remember that. <laughs> okay. All right. Overall, Brody Campbell's career as a swimmer was highly successful and she'll be remembered as one of Australia's greatest female sprinters. True. So like you're no longer with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's very, I mean, that is true, though. I mean, it's true. You will yeah. be. Yeah. There you go. So not... Not not incredibly accurate. I'm going to give it two out of ten. That was oh, yeah. not That's ideal. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, I Bridge actually sent through a, a word document which had her bio followed by chat. Who do we chat? What chat GPT? GPT. GPT. Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I misunderstood, and I read Bridge's through first, and I said, God. This AI writes beautifully. So anyway, we probably should have gone with the more accurate one. But I think everyone knows who you are. But if not, you're a bloody great swimmer and you're still swimming. Yes. Yes. But confusion is okay from the robot, I think. Yeah. I had 18 months off after the last Olympics and I haven't really told anyone that I was swimming again. Um, but I have been for the last few months with an aim to go to Paris Olympics. Oh, yeah. wow. What wow. Are you, what, you when's exciting. Paris Olympics? Um, 2024, so oh, okay, July, great. August 2024. Wow, great. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I mean, in defense of the machines, they are still learning. So they are, they'll, they'll get better. They'll <laughs> get better. trying to <laughs> just, 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 I, defend technology. Yeah. 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 The, I'm, I've got so many questions to ask you, but I, that's not my job because- well, um, not, in a, not in a vulnerability house. No, mm. there's one question to answer. But we, we just caught up and I- it's often to like try and just get a feel for what the interview might be like, but I have just asked you so many questions about your program and oh, yeah. fitness stuff, your, the <laughs> food that you eat and sleep and and things that we're probably not here. Uh, that's what I want to ask more questions about. Maybe we'll do that off air. Yeah, we can, we can get another lunch. Yes, please. I love talking about this stuff. We had a great conversation. Oh, I, I really enjoyed it too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I was invited. <laughs> I definitely didn't get we the invite. No. That's okay. No, that's fine. All <laughs> good. Uh, so, um, Bronte, in front of you is a deck of bluey cards, and on each of these cards is a question which will hopefully uh, invoke some form of vulnerability from you. If you pick the top three cards and um, read them out loud, and if one of them strikes a chord, resonates with you in some way, then um, we would love it if you could uh, answer. Um but don't feel like you need to. If none of them really are good for you, you can just sort of keep picking cards until there's one that you want to answer. It's pretty loose rules here. There's about 40 cards here, so that could take a while. And <laughs> also, I have actually listened to the podcast before and I love your guys' work. Oh, thank, um, you, thank you, But I didn't realise when you said that there were bluey cards that there were actually cards with bluey the dog on it. Like, <laughs> Yes, I know. I was like, oh, they're just blue-ish. Oh. <laughs> but they're... <laughs> <laughs> They're actually bluey, so um, yeah. this is a nice peek behind the curtain for me. That's really yes. good. They are really yeah, bluey. traditional, like unlicensed bluey cards. They're, 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 yeah, they're pretty blue. These cards. <laughs> yes. All right. So picking the first cards. Oh, so a good one it says, "Who have you never properly thanked for the influence they had on your life?" Hmm. Hmm. Have we had that question come up before? I'm not sure we have. I'm not sure we have. It's a good one, though. That's a really good question. Yeah. It's a lovely question. That's actually mm. embarrassing long list of people yeah. that come oh. to mind when mm. that... Really? I mean, who do you sit down and you say, thank you so much for the influence you've had on your life? I feel like you sort of I guess so, thank yeah. people along the way, but it's very rare that I would sit down and like contemplate the whole thing. Mm. Yeah, it's true, because often you feel and probably feel the need to thank people once like a relationship comes to an end. Like if you're like a working relationship yeah, and you're like, yeah. oh, thank you so much for all that. Yeah. As opposed to during it, like if you're still working with the person. Or, yeah. or in your case, like after you win a race, like to your coach, thanks so much for everything you've done, but not. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I thank him after a race. Like you said, like there's a milestone you say thank you, but like there's some people that have an influence on your life, but there's no milestone. Like I'm thinking of like my best friend. Oh. There's no like milestone for like, oh, we just achieved this in our friendship. It's yeah. like, no, thank you for like the influence you've like had mm. just by being yourself that I don't think we really do. Oh, well, I no, don't do that. No, I don't do that. Yeah, I'm going to sure. go home and say thank you to my best friend. Yeah. Oh. I like this. Um, Who's your best friend? <laughs> Olivia Russell. <laughs> go live. <laughs> Russell. Um, in next card, in a film about your life, what challenges would the main character have to overcome? The main character being 
you. The main character being me. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> Joe's someone else. <laughs> It's a film about my life, but the main character's mum. So the main about... character is my best friend, Olivia Russell. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah, that, I love that question. Yeah. That's an interesting one. No, I one. really like that one. Um, got a few things coming up for that, but we'll pick the third one and see what happens. If given a free pass, how would you want to be forgiven? Oof. I mean, that's heavy. <laughs> With flowers or <laughs> <laughs> from Olivia? Just yeah. like just ten grand should cover it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually think the one that sort of spoke the most to me was the film about your life, and not just because I want someone to make a film about my life. Um, but there's been a lot of challenges in swimming that I've had to overcome in order to perform. But mm. there's also been if you're thinking about the film of your life, it's more than just what's in the pool. And I think that's what's really interesting mm. about this one. There's some challenges that aren't necessarily in the swimming pool, which form mm. part of the life story, which, yeah, I think that's I think that's going to be my, my one okay. bluish, well. bluey card. <laughs> is there, um, just before you get started into actually answering it, is there are there any actors that come to mind who would be playing you in the movie about you? Well, I've not really thought about it, but Emma Watson. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great choice. I think she'd be great. Sure yeah. Like. yeah. Yeah. Emma, if you're listening. <laughs> I think she listens. I'm pretty who sure plays she plays Olivia Russell? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Maybe like... Um, like Miranda Kerr or someone. Cool. That'd okay. be cool. Yeah. Miranda Kerr doesn't act, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> That'd be a huge challenge for her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she could do it, but you know. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so... Um, I'm just em- thinking, who, like, who would play your... Who mm. would you like to play you? Eugene Levy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, didn't need that much of a, an agreement. <laughs> That's, I'm sort of oh. hoping people will go, no, not Eugene Levy. You look nothing like him. But well, you picked him. Like, yeah, I know. Yeah. It's sort of the... you, you mean Eugene Levy like a few years ago. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> 40 years ago. What about, I think we know yours. Yeah, the weirdest thing came to my head then if who would like to play me, which is, I always don't want to say because it's so weird. I'd like you to say... <laughs> Claudia Carvin. <laughs> wow. wow. No, I, Claudia Carvin? I don't know. She's great. Well, it's a, <laughs> definitely a stretch for her, but she's a great actress. Who, who doesn't think, love Claudia Carvin? She'd be amazing. Is, but, this something, is this something you've thought about before? That, I watched like, her Australian story the other night and I just thought, I remember I, gig, I was on the couch by myself yeah. and I thought, oh, if anyone was like played my character, it would be her. And I, gig, I was like, that's not going to happen because it's weird. She's just, something about her face is just so vulnerable and open and yeah oh, not not like not she looks like me That's no not what no, you're I don't think, no i don't she looks like me <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> i yeah. just thought she seems like one of the best people of all time i'd yeah. like her to represent me but it, anyway this has got very weird very quickly <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> josh, okay you, <laughs> oh yeah josh who would play you? Oh, um matt damon <laughs> <laughs> actually it's pretty good can i have rick davies Oh, yes. of Rick Davies play me? That'd be yeah. the honour of a lifetime. Former guest on the podcast, yeah. Rick Davies, yeah. Well, it's all hypothetical, so you can have yeah. whoever you want. I just, I'd like to hang out with him more, so I feel like if you had to play me, we'd have to hang out a bit. Yeah. And so okay. that could be an excuse. All right. Yeah. Okay, anyway, this is definitely not the Back subject. to Bronte? <laughs> yeah, back to Bronte. <laughs> um, Sorry, Bronte, I made that very weird by saying Claudia Garden. <laughs> <laughs> so... So, Bronte, yes, in a film about your life, what challenges would your character... With the lead character being you, Bronte, have to overcome? I think I'd answer in two ways. I think the obvious thing would be about injury and all the things I've had to do in the pool to overcome that. So for background, I've been injured for over half my career and trying to manage that and mm. overcome it in order to perform has been um, a very long process but I actually kind of want to go a little bit further back and talk about comparison instead. Oh, okay. So yeah. for people that don't know, me and my older sister, Kate, compete in the same swimming event. Mm-hmm. So we compete in the 100 and the 50 metres freestyle. And that means that we compete against each other a lot of the time. 
for a limited resource, which is a spot on the team or a gold medal or a place on the podium. Um, and we've been doing that for on an international stage for over 10 years. But I've been doing that since I was seven years old when I first started oh, swimming. Gosh. And um, we not only used to train together, we also lived together. When we went around teams, we'd room together. Um, and the comparison started for me at an incredibly young age because Kate as well, she hates me saying this, but it's true and I say it with like a lot of pride. She is objectively better than me. Um, which chat GPT did not pick up on. <laughs> Do you mean objectively but, better in the sense that she's like more successful? Yeah, or, if you right. looked at Kate's like stats, times, yeah, if, we've, if right. we compared them, like her times are faster than me. She's achieved a lot more than me. Um, she's been in the sport longer than on Like pretty much every single metric, she will be better than I am, mm -hmm. um, including she qualified for her first Olympics when she was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So when I got to 15 years old, the questions are, well, when are you going to make oh, your team? Oh, wow. Like, but, I mean, I qualified for my first Olympics when I was 17, but it's not as good as 15. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and whether it's, whether it's external or whether it's something, like sometimes people actively would say things like that, but sometimes it's just coming from inside of yourself, like that little demon that everyone has that's like always looking around being like, or what's everyone else doing? And comparison to Kate, I was right next to her every single day. So I could compare mm -hmm. myself in training every single day to this is what the best in the world looks like. And that made me a very good swimmer. But it also um, was incredibly challenging at points. And I think if we were different people and we had different backgrounds, we it would have imploded. But... I'm very grateful that it hasn't and we've used it as an asset in the latter part of our career, but definitely growing up it was it was a tricky one. There's the the saying like wow. comparison is the thief of joy. Is that mm. is that what it did to you at certain parts of your career? Take the joy away from swimming? Having that Yeah, I think having that definitely did and when we first started swimming it was I'll, t <laughs> I'll take you all the way back why this is so ironic that I even have to bother about dealing with Kate as someone to be compared to. When I first started swimming, I was seven years old. I just moved to Australia from Malawi. I just watched the 2000 Olympics. I watched Grant Hackett win the 1500 freestyle. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to be an Olympic swimmer. I'm going to swim 1500 metres. Um, I don't want to do that. I only want to swim 50 meters, but um, that bit came that bit came later. And I used to, we moved to a brand new country with people, didn't know a single person, um, moved halfway through the school term. I'd never been to school before. I did homeschool when I was in Malawi. And the thing that brought me to into Australia and made me have a sense of belonging was the swimming pool down the road where I could walk to and train hard. And this was something that um, made me feel like myself, but people also liked that I was doing that. Like mm -hmm. it became part of this this way to be be normal. I was, a, I was like a kid who'd never worn shoes. Like I would walk down the road to the, to the swimming pool. <laughs> I would get myself up early an hour before training started, um, set my own alarm. I was seven at this point. Jeez. And then put on my cap and goggles and my togs and walk barefoot to the swimming pool. <laughs> <That's adorable. laughs> Down Moggle Road in each field. Cap and goggles on and then I'd sit on the side of the pool and watch the big kids train for 45 minutes because I was convinced it was going to make me an Olympic swimmer. That and that's all best. I wanted when I was seven that years old. That is the old. best. It's, oh. Isn't it tragic? <laughs> no, it is. It's not pretty all. adorable. It's, I, I used to, when I got my first pair of footy boots, I wore them to the footy at the MCG. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> not, not extremely practical. Oh, that's and, so good. And when Josh, my younger brother by six years, when my friends used to come over when you would have been about six, mm. seven. Yeah. He would just like walk in. I'd be hanging out with him trying to do cool stuff because like 13, 14, and he'd just walk into my bedroom fully dressed in his cricket whites, pads on, <laughs> helmet on, with a bat and a ball just standing there looking at us. So, yeah. Are we going to play back out cricket? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's something about the gear when you're a kid. Oh, the gear Maybe the when best. you're an adult too, but yeah. like, you just yeah. want the gear on. Like it Absolutely. puts you in the zone. Did you, sorry, did you swim in 
uh, Malawi before? Was swimming yeah. part of your life before coming to Australia? Yeah, not in a competitive sense. Okay. So yeah. my mum was a synchronized swimmer. Yeah. And she used to teach that at the local high school. And I used to jump in with those guys and swim. I was like five or whatever. Yeah. And then Malawi's got a big lake. So we used to swim in that lake a lot. It was more of like a fun environment. And my, my grandma used to teach kids swimming in her backyard as well. Yeah. There's sort of been this like love of swimming through the, the female generation of my family, which yeah, has yeah. been passed down. But um, I loved it, but it was never like a, a competitive training thing. That until happened I once you were here. Flicked the switch and was like, okay, I want to I want to race. I want to train. And so, yeah, I used to train five days a week, and that's a this lot. Is when you're seven? Yeah, when I was seven. Um, maybe my coach pulled me back. He was like, I don't really want to see you five days a week. There's no world champion seven year olds. Yeah. He was, he was quite smart. Yeah, yet. <laughs> they all wore their cap to training. Maybe they would. Um, and I went to our. Uh, Kate also used to swim at the swim club. How um, much older is Kate? She's two years older. Two, two. So, yeah, really close in age. But you would just walk there by yourself. Oh, yeah. Seven year old walking by themselves, no shoes on, fully yeah. dressed, ready to go. Yeah, just Unbelievable. ready what to dive in. How early is this? Pretty early. Oh, it probably wouldn't have been that early. It was probably like 6 30 or 7 oh, or okay. something. Pretty like, early. Yeah. Early for me. <laughs> early for me. <laughs> um, early for me now, now that I'm older, but yeah. kids wake up early, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's they're, true. They're springy that's like that. I certainly um, do. <laughs> so Kate would come at, like, say, training start at 7 o'clock. She would rock up at five minutes to seven, which is on time. Yeah. Um, early i would just be like 45 minutes early um and she used to turn around at the flags and walk on the bottom of the pool and like try let people lap her so she didn't have to do as many laps but um oh. i used to like count my laps and count her laps and be like you got to do more or like she just, she just didn't really care about it it was just a fun place for her which is also fine um and then we went to our first swimming carnival and i won like four medals and my age championship trophy and Kate won a bronze medal in the 25 backstroke, which she was quite happy with until it was compared to my gold medals, right. <laughs> oh which I like to wear yeah. around my neck and I'd clink and like yeah. a seven, like I was if pretty was. proud of it. Like, yeah. um, and she stole my medals and um, hid them under her bed, which is, I think, probably the only self-respecting thing you can do when your younger sister is parading around <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and mum was like okay Bronte worked really hard for her medals like yeah probably don't wear them around every day but um, I've watched you train and you don't work hard and that's fine but if you don't work hard you may end up with a bronze medal and that's that's fine if that's all you want but if you want the medals you can't steal them you have to work for them <laughs> um, good lesson and that was the monster of Kate getting created. The, wow. One of the best. Yeah. So that was built from comparison. It was built from comparison and built from my dream, my yeah. comparison. <laughs> yeah. I was the one who was like doing my wow. dream. And then she was like, oh, I like that. I'm going to, um, I'm going to train hard. And she committed to wanting to do the Olympic dream. But I think also from that age, like I never even saw it as, oh, Kate's taken over my dream. It was like, oh, let's do this together. Yeah. It was mm. like a, it was like a nice thing, like oh, let's do it mm. together. Imagine like going to the Olympics together. Um, but even at that at that age, were you being told by people, or was it clear that you were better than the average seven, eight, nine year old? No, I didn't. Um, I don't think I won my an age championship until I was sixteen. Oh, okay, so you so, weren't like immediately. No, when I say I won those four medals, it was at like. A local meet down the road, okay, okay, okay. like twenty-five meter races. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah. they were just exciting medals for me. They gotcha, were. It yeah. wasn't like I was this State insane talent yeah. who just rocked up. It was um, that came a little bit later. Okay, yeah, mm. because it. I mean, I think we all know that it's such a weird feeling of when you start, you find like a new interest, and then one of your friends goes like, "Oh, I might, I might do that as well," yeah. and then they start doing it, and they're they're easily better at it than you are mm. um, or they get more attention for it or whatever. It, it is, it's weirdly annoying. Yeah, you're like, that's, but it's that's mine. mine. It's yeah. mine. <laughs> I found that. Yeah. 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 I completely, but and then for it to be your sister who you're living with, I mean, it's so great that you were able to kind of like come to a place where you're excited to do it together and climb together. But well, I think we were excited because we were kids and it's yeah. like, you only really know the people in your family. And I was, this is when I'm very young. 
and sort of went through different stages of the comparison being a good and a bad thing. And at that age, it was actually great to have Kate there. And you only really know the people in your family. We just moved to a new country. I didn't know anybody else. So the fact that my best friend and my sister wanted to join me on this was actually a really yeah. nice thing. Mm. Um, and I didn't see it as a, oh, she's taking my thing. It was like, oh, cool. Like, I'm not going to be alone doing this because I don't yeah. know anyone else. Mm. <laughs> and you don't have to keep counting her laps. She'll yeah, now, yeah, now she'll just count her own laps. Yeah. <laughs> but I probably would have counted them anyway. If, <laughs> if you could look up like an absolute swimming geek, like that was me. I was just an absolute nerd about it and yeah. so intense about it yeah um i'm a lot more relaxed now <laughs> which is a weird thing to say mm. and so uh, was there a point when you're a child or teenager where where it sort of started to move from being oh this is fun that we're swimming together to i really want to be better what, did that ever happen i want to be like yeah. the the more successful of the two of us it definitely did happen and we qualified for our first Olympics together in 2012. So Kate had gone to the 2008 Olympics. She won two bronze medals. Um, and then in 2012 we qualified for the 2012 Olympics together in the 50 freestyle. And that is the happiest I've ever been after any race I've ever done. Like. Is in the, like the national trials, the, the qualification for it. So yeah, the way the way trials worked, which Huey spoke about, was um, now they're five weeks before they used to be three months before the major meet, whatever it is. You go to trials. If you come first or second, you qualify for the team. If you come third, you don't qualify. So that's you got to come back in four years and try again. Um, and the fifty freestyle was the last possible chance for me to qualify for the team. And I had to finish first or second. And I was racing against Libby Trickett, who I'd grew up um, watching race and watching her do a really good thing. I was like, I'm going to have to beat her and my sister, one of them at least, to come second in this race. And Kate touched the wall first and I touched the wall second. And that is the happiest I've ever been. Like, hands down, I've never felt that happy after a race because it was, it was finally happening. Like, the two of us were going to go to the Olympics together, yeah. like that first realization of the dream so that was that was an amazing thing and for both of us going to that olympics together was this realization of this thing that we talked about when we were seven and nine years old in the back of the car on the way to training mm. we're going to go to the olympics together mm. um and we both used each other as a comfort on that team it's quite an overwhelming environment i 17 when i qualified i was 18 when i went and like pretty shy, pretty awkward in this, in, like there's 10,000 athletes in this village. I'm looking at Michael Phelps and Usain Bolt walking around and I'm like, I barely know how to like talk to anybody, <laughs> 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 let alone these people. And like Nadal's like sitting at breakfast with me and I'm like, your head's exploding. So I was like yeah. very much, Kate's my crutch in this situation and so good to have her because she'd been here before. Mm. Even the other people on the team, I grew up idolizing them and watching them race and now I'm on the same team as them so in that overwhelming environment so good to have mm. Kate yeah but then as we got as we got older the comparison became more and more from from the outsides and I'd have people actively asking me well when are you going to beat her at that point the narrative and the story was oh it's amazing you can do this together and then from 2012 until 2014, Kate was undefeated internationally in the 100 freestyle. So 2012, she actually had pancreatitis at the Olympics and couldn't compete in the 100 freestyle. But then like after the Olympics, she internationally, she was undefeated. So I sort of faced with a situation where I could be the second best person in the world and not even the best person in my family. <laughs> and people are God. going, and people act like swimming parents and people on the street and randoms just saying well the real question is when are you going to beat your sister in a sort of tongue-in-cheek way or not like a sort of just genuinely or genuinely putting forward yeah i think at some point you stop differentiating between how someone's intending something yeah. because the question's yeah. still the same it's like mm. they may be kind of joking but there's a reason that they're asking that yeah and it was like this expectation of no matter what you do it doesn't matter how much. And I was getting, each year I was getting faster and my PBs were getting better and I was getting higher world rankings. But like nobody was looking at any of that. 
All yeah. they were looking at is, have you beaten your sister? Mm. Which is, she was the best in the world. Probably an unfair comparison. Like I don't think, I don't think any other swimmer was getting asked, when are you going to beat yeah. the best person in the yeah. world? Unless mm. they'd put it out there that they wanted to do that, mm. which I hadn't put out. Like, oh hey, my goal is to beat Kate at any meet. But she was, not only was she undefeated in every international race, but then I was training with her every single day, and she was on fire, and I was getting beaten. Every single day, and then someone saying, "Why didn't you beat her?" And you're like, <laughs> "I'm trying <laughs> <Yeah>. very hard." <laughs> yeah. And, and so, what's that? So after you have a swim against her and she wins, um, is it? Maybe this is more of a question for her, but is it hard? Well, two part question: Is it hard for you to be happy for her when she's your sister and she's doing so well? But then also from her point of view, I wonder, is it hard for her to show her excitement in front of you? Great question, right? <laughs> it mm. is a really good question. And at that point, no. But there was a particular sort of turning point where it did become really difficult. So for a long time it was like, okay, as long as you've both just done a good race. So say in 2014 at the Commonwealth Games, she won the 100 freestyle and I came second in the 100 freestyle. And I went under 53 seconds for the first time ever. And I was like ecstatic. Like, mm. and she had just done a really good time as well. And she was, and she'd won and she was, she was stoked. So that's like joy amplified. Yeah. Like mm. what an amazing thing. Like this is, this is the actual dream. Um, and then a year later, um, at not as big a meet, but a big meet, um, she just had shoulder surgery and she had just come back from it. And we swam 100 freestyle and I went 53.13 and she went 53.12 and she beat me. And she'd just come back from surgery and she wasn't supposed to beat me. She wasn't like, 100%. It, yeah, in yeah. my mind, she wasn't 100%. She, that, I, should, I should have won that race. 53-1 in season is actually not a bad time. But 0.01 and she's won the race. Mm. She was very happy that she'd done a good time. But she knew also that I wasn't going to be as happy. So then it's this this conflict where you're like, oh, I just don't know how to celebrate this in a in a positive way. And an an ex like the bigger example of that is um the 2018 Commonwealth Games. And that is the best 100 freestyle I've ever swum. That's where my PB was, um, which is hilarious because it's a long time ago now. But I I won that race. I went 52.27 and Kate went 52.6 and she came second in that race. And she had been at the 2016 Olympics. She was the world record holder going into that race. And 2016 Olympics was the hardest thing I think Kate's ever had to do. Because she does not like expectation. She wants to please everyone. And the, the pressure of going in as world record holder was, was too much for her at that time. And she came sixth in the 100 freestyle. 2018 was her comeback event from that. It was the first time she competed internationally since 2016. And, like, I watched how difficult 2016 was for her. And then, <laughs> two years later, I am the person stopping her from having a fairy tale ending to that chapter of her life. Like, the work that she had to do, I don't think anyone can really understand how hard it was for her to pick herself up and keep going. Like she could have stopped and I don't think anyone would have blamed her for that. Um, but the strength that she showed to keep going and I'd just done this amazing race. I'd come off a bunch of injuries. It was the first time um, that I realized I could be injured and perform well. And I was like over the moon excited and Kate was there, like, arms around me, cheering me on, on the podium, smiling. But, like, I knew that it was also hurting her. 
God, what a strange <laughs> thing to experience. Mm. Yeah, it is a strange thing. It's like incredible. If you talk about like bittersweet being a th- mm. being a strange thing, that is that is exactly it. Because even even when I was achieving the thing that I really wanted, um, there is still this tinge of I've kind of upset my sister in this process. Going into that race, were you was that reality already present for you? Did you know if I beat her, that's that's the outcome here? Or did that only occur to you once it happened? No, I only thought about it afterwards. Yeah. Um I love racing. Yeah. Um I never think about whether I'm gonna beat anyone. Yeah, okay. I yeah. um Mm, that's interesting. No, never. Like, I love it. Like, you just get up and you're just like, okay, like, I mean, you do think you, when I get up behind the blocks, I don't think about if I'm going to beat a single person, but mm. I think about there's seven other people here. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you're not personalizing let's see, it. Let's yeah. see what we can do. And they're, they're all just people at that point. Like, I, both of us have got very good at being like, that's not my sister next to me. That's mm-hmm. that's our person in lane four or a person in lane six or whatever. Um, Even in 2018? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't expected to win that as well. Like Kay was expected to win it. I did a PB by 0.3 of a second, which is quite a lot. Mm. Um, I went faster than I'd done all season. It was like, it was a very good race to get that result. It wasn't expected. I didn't expect it. Mm-hmm. I had no idea that that was coming. So I definitely wasn't thinking about it before the race, but it's more, more afterwards. Um, even when we were standing on the podium, like I could... I mean, it's your sister, you know her very yeah. well. I could see the effort that she was putting in to, like, smile and support me. And, he, like, even watching that effort is, like, painful to watch yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Gosh. That must be so hard that you – so for years people are asking you when, you, when are you going to beat her? And then you do it and you can't even have full enjoyment of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's – that's the big lesson about comparison is it's really like there is no win. Even even when you win, you don't yeah, win. You don't, like yeah. there's no absolute winning with it. So, and it's not that I didn't enjoy it. I definitely did. It's just that there's, there's a tinge. There's a tinge, yeah. which is why both of us love the, being in a relay team together. Yeah. So like we get mm. to from 20... 2013 until 2021, we've been on relay teams together that have broken world records and mm. won Olympic gold medals and Commonwealth Games medals and world champs. And like, that's amazing. That mm. must be a relieving part of the meet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm. it is. Once the individual stuff's done. Cause it, well, normally it's first up. Is it first up? Yeah, okay. the relay's normally first. Um, right. And then the individual stuff comes okay. later. So it is nice to have this experience together and then, um, and then move on to the, the individual stuff, which can be really tricky. And it, it never, it didn't used to be. And then as we got older and I wanted to be my own person. Um, and I think with your siblings, you kind of get to this point or I did anyway, that I wanted to be seen as me and Kate, the duo for a really long time. And I loved that. And I loved that identity. And then I got sick of being in Kate's shadow and it was, that shadow is not going to move away. Like she's, she's a big she actually is a very big, tall person, um, but <laughs> she's, she's a big presence yeah. and she cast a big shadow. Like, if I want to get out of this, I have to move away. Mm. Like, I have to step out of it. I can't stand next to her and not be in a shadow. Mm. So it only became a problem when I wanted to start doing that. Was there uh, any part of you in, ste- in deciding to sort of step away from the shadow? That's, that's sort of, even though that, that's very kind of like, it's it's self empowering and 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 it's exciting. But is there any part of it that's kind of scary? Because I don't know, maybe there's a comfort in being in in the shadow. There is definitely comfort in it, and it's where I'd been for a long time. Um, and more than performance comfort, there's also this comfort in identity and like this is always a place that you can be at home. And then there's also the bit where. In order to differentiate myself from my sister, I'm going to have to put distance, which when you've got close relationships, that can also be painful for both people. Mm. Um, like how do you create distance without losing connection is really tricky. So how, how did you do it? How did you create <laughs> the distance? Not or? well at first. Um, it, it definitely took us a while to find like a good equilibrium. Um, and when was this? 
this would have been like around 2016 as well. Yeah. Um, so I would have been 22 and Kate would have been 24. Um, and we stopped living together, which was the first thing. Was it, dis- really was it discussed? Sorry to cut you off, but did you say, yeah. did you sit down and say, I think we need like time apart or some distance or what is that? <laughs> or just, you just made the decisions that suggested that's what, you know. Yeah. If I went back, I would have a discussion about it. Um, pretty hard at 22. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, if only I knew what I knew seven years ago, right? Um, pretty hard at 41, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe the age bit isn't the problem. Maybe it's just a hard thing to talk I about. I think it is. Um, so, no, we didn't talk about it. And that's probably the problem is um, it's like, oh, hey, I want to do something different. It's not because of you. It's because I need to do something different. It's like... It's like breaking up with someone, but mm. you're not breaking up with them. You still want to see them, but you want to see them in a different way. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, And yeah, we just started making decisions that would m- mean that we were doing different things a lot so of you, the time. And so you moved out, mm-hmm. moved to a different state, is that right? Or? Oh, eventually, but yeah, okay. lived, lived in Brisbane. So we still trained every day together, but I mean, we'd become so enmeshed that we were had the same friendship group. We would do a lot of the same things. And swimming's a pretty isolating thing anyway because you train early in the morning, then you've got a chunk of time in the middle of the day, which is free, where you're studying normally from home because, like, who can be bothered to go to uni for three <laughs> hours of lecture when you're doing something part-time, right? And mm. then you train in the afternoon and then you're exhausted and you go to bed. So, like, not many 22-year-olds are living that life. Yeah. Um. And so the opportunity to hang out with other people is quite limited. Mm. So we definitely like did a lot of the same things. It was like, I live with Kate. It's easy. If I want to go do something, I'll just do it with her. Um, But it it had had to actively take a step away from that and find things that that I enjoyed doing. And that's where that bit of like, no, this is mine. Like Mm. that feeling came in that um, you were talking about before. How are you guys different? Are you guys like... (laughs) We are so different, which is why it's it is so funny that we got seen as one person for a mm. long time. Like it was like, oh, Kate and Bronte, or like if I went to if I went to catch up with friends, I'd be like, oh, where's Kate? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it was like we were literally yeah. a a package deal deal, like um, like the Kit Kat or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but we're very different. Like Kate's quite um a little bit more reserved more shy i'd say she's a lot more caring than i am a lot less flippant than i am she thinks quite deeply about things and talks quite slowly um she's more on the introverted spectrum than i would be i'm very extroverted get my energy from people like Mm. to be around people um talk a lot (laughs) um (laughs) so very different then we have based off of that very different interests did you did you always realize that you were different from a young to each other from a young age, or is that something you've been learning since 2016? You guys are very good at asking questions. <laughs> jo- Josh particularly is <laughs> known for it. <laughs> that is a very pertinent question because, no, I didn't really realise I was different, but everybody else did. Wow. Like people who were close to me were like, yeah, yeah, you and your sister are different, but I saw us as the same because we were doing the same things. You can't, yeah, you're kind of defined by your activities and your interests when you're a kid, I guess. So if you both like swimming, then you're the same. Yeah. Yeah. You both, you both, yeah, but absolutely. Like you both like swimming. And then, I mean, if people saw us out, it'd be like, oh, you both like going to the movies together. Oh, you both like doing this. And Mm -hmm. we did have a lot of interests that we really liked. Like we both like Harry Potter, but like, I don't think we're very unique in that. (laughs) I think a lot of people (laughs) like Harry Potter. Specifically Um, Emma Watson. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Um, And this might be a, Bit personal, but did you want to be like her when you say you, you you thought you were the same or similar, and other people saw you as different? It, during that, were you wanting to be like her, or did you yeah. just yeah yeah? I think so, definitely in the in the pool, like yeah, one or two, and then outside of it as well. I mean, she's, mm. I mean, you guys know what it's like. You're brothers, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You want to be like your older siblings. That's. Mm. I think that's pretty natural and I definitely had that. Like I want to be I want to be like Kate. I want to be like Kate. And then it was like, oh, actually, I don't want to be like Kate. I want to be Bronte. Yeah. Which is a different thing and difficult to um articulate. And and 
it wouldn't take uh, a genius to realize that I'm projecting a bit here <laughs> in these questions um, because I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, um, especially when, well, you love your sibling uh, or siblings, I should say. When someone has blazed a path that is so successful um, in any respect um, and they're your sibling, I guess you, uh, for me I'm like, well, I just want to be like that because that's successful. And it's kind of scary when you realise the moment of like, well, I'm not that successful, but I'm also not that person either. And that kind of like stepping off into discovering who you are. And it sounds a bit strange to say it like that because it's not like I made a conscious decision to do that. I just found myself with no other option. (laughs) What do you mean? Well, in sort of learning to be who you are um, as opposed to trying to be like someone else, the person I'm sitting next to, um, I d- I'm not sure. I think it's easy to talk about in hindsight and say it was a con- like I-, I started to move away from that and decide. But it, I find it to be a lot more tumultuous and scary and under- like um, we don't know. You don't know where you're going and you don't know hmm. who you are. You don't know what you're finding. So it's easy to make it sound like a linear story when you're talking about it in hindsight. But at the time, you just feel lost. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're you're very right and. The image that comes to mind when you're talking about that is, you ever been like jungle bashing? <laughs> yeah, I have actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Hugh's walking in front, Kate's walking in front and they're clearing the path. Mm. And then at some point you're like, I'm going to start making my own path. Yeah. And you're like, this is just a jungle now. Like Whoa. this is, I don't know where I'm going you at say, all. <laughs> you say Kate's a deep thinker. I think, I think you are. <laughs> that is a really good analogy. Yeah. yeah. I think, and that's the word, I mean, you described, I just put an image to it but um that's exactly how it felt is like Mm. well I don't I was following a path now I don't know where I'm going and that's terrifying Mm. and then it's really exciting yeah because you don't know what's on the other side and you can go any which way you want yeah exactly now you get to pick and choices terrifying and then it's exciting Mm. um Mm. and trying to like I've spent a lot of time trying to close the gap between the terrifying and the exciting and I do it all the time in trying to pick up when something's not working and then jump straight into uncertainty and like people hate uncertainty. They don't like not knowing where they're going. But if something's not working, I'd rather jump into uncertainty than stay on the certain path and I don't like where it's going. So I try to jump straight into uncertainty and stay there until the excitement of where I'm going um, sort of presents itself. And that's that's taken a, a long time to figure out how to mm. do that. How, um, in that journey and in the bush bashing your own path, <laughs> which is such a good analogy, um, it must have been at a strain on the relationship between you and Kate. I'm assuming you've managed to sort of come back together, so to speak. Like, how do how do you how do you when you've had a relationship that's so close based on one form of identity and then you've blazed your a new identity how do you rebuild or or foster that relationship with the new identity yeah i think it was and definitely we have i guess come back together but it was it was different for us as well in that even though we were actually both looking for a bit of space to discover like kate Mm. really after 2016 wanted to discover who she was outside the pool and um took a year off from competitive swimming and skydived and like challenged herself in all a bunch of different ways. So I think it came at a good time is that we we're both looking to do the same thing. Mm. Um, but we also, she was still training quite a lot. So even though we were both looking for a distance, we still saw each other every day, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is unnatural. I think normally if you were looking for a distance, you wouldn't automatically see someone every day. Um, you would have to actively make an effort to see each other. Mm. So in some ways it was good because I don't know how much we would have seen each other if we had to make an effort. And in other ways it was like very hard to keep someone at arm's length when they're just right in your space the whole time. Mm. But um, we've definitely got a great equilibrium now. And I think the competitiveness that we have in the pool when we're actually racing, the transfer that started to happen which we don't do anymore but started to happen was we transferred it to the other aspects of our life it's like okay we're not going to compare ourselves in the pool because we acknowledge that that's not helpful and not fair 
like who's doing the most fun thing on the weekend? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. And like that was never overt and maybe it was just from my point of view. Um, but it was like, okay, I'm not going to compare myself to Kate in the pool. I'm not, I'm not, not that I'm not going to try to be better than her. I'm going to try, do my best. But like, how else can I be better than her? <laughs> if I can't be better at her than this, like how else can I do it? Just secretly cooking in the background, trying to kind of like become a master chef. And one day, say to Kate, hey, do you, do you want to do dinner tonight? Do you want me to do it? Or we could both do a version and see who's is the better dinner. Yeah. <laughs> and this is how I dreamt up master chef. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in um, just listening to you both talk about that and your shared experience of... Um, bush bashing behind an older sibling mm. and for a long time thinking this is really good. I'm so interested to, to get Kate's thoughts on this because as the older sibling, when you're like, like you know, forging a path and you go ahead and then you turn around and all of a sudden they're not they're like they're not there anymore, your first thing is to think, I don't, do they not like me anymore? Mm. That's like a bit of a thing that you go through of like, I don't know if they like me at the moment. And rather than like we're talking about having the conversation of like going, you wish you'd had the conversation. It's so obvious. I remember a point where Josh was no longer following behind and that was my first thought. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't know why I didn't go, you know, he's probably trying to be his own person. It's totally fine. I was like, he doesn't like me. Well, of course he of course he didn't do that. Like we think everything's about ourselves. We're like, <laughs> yeah, no. if they've picked a different path, it must be because of me. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, you have to talk to Kate about it, but mm. um. I definitely think that she would have had that thought. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. It's not just you and Kate. In, you've got other siblings. How many siblings are there? There's me and four others. You and four others, right. So and what are the age? What's the age kind of? So we're all two years apart except right. for the last one who's three years younger. Okay. So Kate's the eldest yeah. and then me and then there's three others. So when you guys are going through this sort of like swimming brilliance and you're both like achieving all this stuff and then there's the other siblings i'm i don't know maybe maybe this is completely off the mark but like it makes sense like you talking about your older sister and comparing yourself to your older sister because you're both swimming because she's 0.01 faster than you (laughs) but then you're quite you know i don't know what your siblings do you know we're interested in if they're even swimming or whatever but i wonder if they were kind of like Comparing themselves to you guys as well. This is, sorry, I didn't, just this is where I think your story is so fascinating. This around your siblings. Yeah. Um, we particularly talked about your brother before. Yeah, this is, we were talking about it at lunch before. And before I talk about my brother Hamish, um, the my other two sisters, I think, yes, it could have been very difficult for them. Neither of them are swimmers. Mm-hmm. So they didn't step into that arena for comparison and do very different things and lead very different lives. But I think the success of my parents was in never celebrating mine and Kate's performance in the pool as better than somebody else's achievement in my family. Mm -hmm. And a really good example is my brother Hamish. So my brother was born on my fourth birthday when we were living in Malawi. Um, he was a stillborn who was resuscitated and has cerebral palsy from lack of oxygen to his brain mm-hmm. during birth. It's quite severe cerebral palsy in that he will never speak. He is vision impaired. So he will never walk. He will never be able to feed himself. He'll never be able to sit up. Um, but he's this like delightful, cheeky, <laughs> um, just fun-loving person who Mm -hmm. I grew up with. Um, And it's very difficult. Like people are comparing me and Kate, right? But I'm going home every single day and I've got my brother who used to sit, he had this special chair by the front door and you'd come in and he had like a different like sound and way of greeting each one of us. You could tell by like the way we were talking to him who was there, even though he can't see us. Um, and he'd be there like waiting and then stoked that you're there. Mm. And he'd be like stoked that you spent time with him or play with him or feed him or like whatever. And he literally can't do anything for himself or communicate his needs incredibly effectively. Like that must be so 
frustrating. Mm. Um, but he's not frustrating. He's just this beautiful human being. Um, and he was valued as much as me and Kate. So a good example is I won, when I was 10 years old, I won the 50 metres freestyle at um, Queensland State Sprint Meet or something. It was the first time I'd won a state medal and I was like so excited. Um, I mean, I think I'd come third and second and like, I'd, but it was the first time I'd won. So it was like, for me, it felt like a big deal. I went 30.53 in case anyone cares. <laughs> I, I just just remember my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could tell that's what you all wanted yeah. to know. Um, I was just thinking, God, you didn't do sub 30.54, did you? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Um, and I came home and Hamish, we'd been trying to teach him to hold things. So he likes to throw things. So, um, maybe he was a bowler in a past life. But like, if you put anything in his hand, he'll chuck it. It's like still even though he's quite got a lot of health issues at the moment, it is still like the absolute game that he will still play. If you put something near him, he will throw it. <laughs> um, and we at this time we were hoping he'd learn to feed himself. So teaching him that he had to hold something rather than throw it, and that was a good thing, was um, a really beautiful thing. And Hamish had decided he wanted to hold a spoon. Mm -hmm. So that night we were celebrating that. Mm. Yeah. Which doesn't mean that my achievement went unrecognized it just you just have a level of this is reality and this is swimming up and down a swimming pool and like it's not life or death and it doesn't really impact anyone's life and it's fine mm. but like this is what reality looks like and this is what struggle looks like and um that that comparison um has always lent a really big perspective to my whole family i don't think that's always made it easier for my younger sisters but I think that's why both me and Kate have been able to deal with it as well for so long. Yeah, that is wow. an amazing perspective. It's pretty special. And I think it's also interesting that you can, that what you brought up there is an example of how comparison can lend an incredibly positive um, uh, influence on your life as well. Yeah. Like it, it, comparison's not always negative. People always compare up. Mm. And I... I catch myself doing this all the time. I live in Sydney. You walk around, people are like, imagine if you lived there, imagine if you lived mm. there, imagine, imagine. And you're like, look where you live. Like, <laughs> this is great. Like, I live in a great place. And the same thing with coming from Africa and then living in Australia. Like, when I came here, I was, I could not believe that people didn't have fences around their houses. I couldn't believe I could walk down the street. I couldn't believe I could go to South Bank, that there was like these free, safe, clean, amazing places, that education was free. Like all of these things were amazing. I used to watch the garbage trucks every morning. They were like the most incredible things I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> and I don't, I don't watch the garbage anymore, but maybe sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I should because it's so easy, the hedonic treadmill, right? Like you just mm. get used to what's good and then you keep wanting to go further. And it's like, just look back at all the other things and all the other people in life. Like I remember <laughs> watching someone pull up in a seaplane in Sydney in a cove at Milk Beach, jump out and then walk up to their house. And I was like... It's just quicker for me than to get a taxi all the <laughs> Yeah, around. absolutely, right? Yeah. Like quicker and, yeah. you know, more exclusive, et cetera. And I was like, that dog has a better life than me. Yeah. I'm now comparing myself <laughs> to a dog at this God. point. And I was like, you know what? If I was, and I've been to other third world countries, like say India, if I was in India and I told, I met a beautiful family in India who ended up spending a few days with, if I told them that I'd just spend $100 on an Uber last night, mm. they would look at me like I'm looking at that dog. They'd be like, that is a week's worth of my wages and you, you spent it on an, on an Uber. Yeah. You could have caught a bus. Yeah. And like, I think it's so, I have to, I have to keep catching myself because it's so easy to just keep comparing yourself to everyone who looks like mm. they're doing better than you. Forget that like we're in Australia. Look at us. Like mm. most of us, are safe. Most of us are healthy. Most of us have good connection. Like if you have those things, like you, you're pretty good. You're, you're in a very, unfortunately, you're probably in the minority of the whole world. Mm. Um, it's easy to forget it. 
I love the image. I just I can't stop thinking about your brother greeting people when they come home. I just mm. just the most beautiful image. Yeah. I I just love it so much. Yeah, he's great. Um, we chatted a bit about this before. Uh, yeah, you know, how's he going now, your, your brother? Yeah, he's um up until 2012, he was he had cerebral palsy, but he didn't have a lot of health complications. And then, um, for the last ten years, it's been so many complications compounded. Um. We got a call when I was going to the closing ceremony of the 2012 Olympics and they were like, your your brother's going into surgery and he might not come back out again. Mm. And I went to the closing ceremony and everyone's celebrating and there was all the confetti going everywhere and I was like, I might not have a brother when I get home. Mm. I mean, they didn't say he might not come back out again, but his bowel had nearly ruptured and of course I immediately looked up what that meant. It's not good. Mm. Um, and since then, he's had a lot of um, health issues and his care mainly falls on my mum, who's a registered nurse. Um, so looks after a lot of the medical, or can look after a lot of the medical stuff as well. But um, it's he's been in palliative care for quite a few years as well. But he just keeps like fighting and hanging on and he can be in a lot of pain. But... Um, he still might find a smile just for you when you come home. Like those are the moments where you're like, this is this is actually inspirational. Like mm-hmm. who cares whether you can swim up and down a pool? Like this is this is someone who's fighting to like just be in the world. Like that's an amazing thing to be doing. Um and the thing <laughs> the thing I said to Hugh at lunch was my brother hasn't eaten for like six years. Did you know that you could do that? What? Yeah. So he's he's fed intravenously. It's called TPN, and you can feed someone their uh-huh. bloodstream because his stomach and his bowel doesn't work. Um, you can stay alive without eating. Like this is like really <laughs> wow. amazing. Like I just, it's just incredible his tenacity to stay alive, and also the team that looks after him and the doctors and. Um, my family and I don't live in Brisbane, so his care falls entirely on the rest of my family, um, and it's all of them. It's mm. like this team. As you've said, really beautifully, um, about it's just swimming up and down a pool compared to what your brother is uh, goes through, and and is. But how was it for you when you were? Go, having these internal thoughts of comparison with you and Kay's and your brother's going through s- such severe health complications, that must have been a really tricky thing to hold the, all those things in your head at mm. the same time. I actually think it was helpful in a way. Um, but, I mean, Hamish had been having health complications for quite a long time before me and Kate started to really want to differentiate from each other. Mm. But I think that the fact that we had shared experiences and shared trials that were outside of the pool in a weird way was probably helpful for our relationship. And I think you see it a lot when people go through trials. It either like makes or breaks a relationship. So Mm. our whole family had to band together really strongly at that time. And it's probably why we were able to deal with the extra pressure and comparison that came between the two of us. Yeah, wow, well, that that makes sense. Mm. Almost like it grounded you together in, yeah, a, in something more more important. Yeah, and yeah. it sounds so stupid to get caught up in the... When you look at it with a proper perspective, it does sound stupid to get caught up in a comparison of who went 0.01 of a second faster. But you do get caught up in mm. it because it's mm. your... Sp- it's your sport. You put almost every waking moment thinking about it, thinking about how to do better at it, doing it. So I'm not saying that I always am able to step outside of that mm. and there's times when I haven't been able to, but if I can, it's very helpful. Yeah. Mm. And, and sorry, I, I wasn't. I hope I wasn't sounding, making it sound like I was saying it was stupid to get caught up on those No, you weren't. You I weren't, was just but more it interested. Is. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on in your head. <laughs> you weren't saying that, but like realistically it is, right? <laughs> I mean, everything we do, we made it all up. 
<laughs> like yeah. we made up that it's important. Like it's an Olympic mm. gold medal. It's important because everybody decided that that's important. Mm. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 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 more important to some people, and that's fine. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. okay. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it sort of becomes kind of existential. Where it's like, what is important? <laughs> what is reality? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're in a simulation and the chat GPT is going to take over. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. That's con- very concerning. Hey, I've got a whole new lot of data to work with now after today's <laughs> conversation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, before, before we wrap up, I just thought it could, it could be interesting because you mentioned Libby Trickett before hmm. and that time in your career. It's actually kind of probably the first time in our podcast where uh, like – timelines have like collided from yeah. different episodes because mm. she in her episode on the imperfects she talks about that time from her point of view like yeah. that exact race i think yeah and so i'm just saying that out loud for any i'm assuming a lot of swimming fans listening to this might want to we'll link to her episode but there's an in, the other side of that is really an interesting yeah. perspective Mentioning as well yeah, yeah no, I, I, I actually listened to that episode and i still talk to libby every now and again mm. um and I know, I mean, that's that's the weird thing is I know how challenging that time was for her because she was trying to stay in the sport. Mm. And the, me and my sister were like taking that away from her in in, in essence. And she was probably like a hero of yours. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm. And you're, um, I mean, I remember warming up in lanes next to her and then being like, and now, like, I really respect you. And now I'm going to go out and try beat you. <laughs> yeah. It's a brutal <laughs> thing, isn't it? It is yeah. a brutal thing. Wow. I have loved this so much. So yeah, much. Me too. It's yep. just been the best. I can't wait to go home and tell Penny all about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Penny knows when there's a good episode coming because I've gone home and I can't stop talking about it. But I will. <laughs> this yeah, is one of them. I just, yeah. It's been such a privilege to meet you today. And um, thanks for so generously sharing uh, and so beautifully sharing your story as well. Mm. It, it's. Um, yeah, I, I love sport and I love intelligent people and you are really both of them. <laughs> the and you are really good at sport. <laughs> <laughs> so you're one of those things which is great. No, I just, I just as someone who can articulate the story the way you did, I, it's, I love a good storyteller. So, no. yeah, you're a, a wonderful person and we feel very lucky to. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, yeah. I did ask. <laughs> But they- <laughs> well, don't tell them. That. <laughs> but we um, very excitedly yeah. said, "Oh, really? Okay, yeah, yeah. we'd love you to." Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, the reason I said I did ask is I actually would never normally ask mm. to do any media. Like I don't love it in that way, but I love the space that you guys create. I love the way you help people tell their stories. I love the questions that you have, and it's really inspiring. And I love it. So thank you for having me on. Thank you, Bronte. Wow, I'm definitely telling stuff about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I reckon Emma Watson will be pretty tempted to do this story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's she'll probably be finishing. This is she's listening right now, going, "Okay, I think I got a handle on this." Yeah, <laughs> she's like uh, Hermione Granger. No, Bronte Campbell. He'll be yes. <laughs> Um Bronte, thank you so much. Really lovely to meet you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. The Imperfects is not a licensed mental health service and is not a substitute for professional mental health advice, treatment or assessment. The advice given in this episode is general in nature, but if you're struggling, please see a healthcare professional or call Lifeline on 13114. The Imperfects is hosted and produced by Hugh Van Kylenberg, Ryan Shelton and Josh Van Kylenberg. Our executive producer is Bridget Northeast. This episode is filmed by Andy Poole and edited by George Martin.